ಚಂತ್ಯಾಚಂತ್ಯಾಚಂತ್ಯಾಚಂತ್ಯಾಚಂತ್ಯಾಚಂತ್ಯಾಚಂತ್ಯಾಚಂತ್ಯಾಚ
जाय स परिकर श्री श्री गुरु गौरंग गंधर्व गोविंद सुंदर पाद कवन जय अष्टु जाय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत वेदा शिव श्री गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे माय हम बोलते हैं नमस्कार टॉप ऑफ द बॉडीज थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग अस टुडे एंड सो हैप्पी टू बी विद यू ऑन द Zoom सेशन सो we we'll continue the reading from tribute book chapter 8 as we were doing from last week so maybe yashoda can share his screen with us okay chapter 8 the ways of karma and prema and we will continue reading from maya's illusory environment and uh, satya sundari ji you like to maybe start with the reading Okay. 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 So what is not throws is Maya. When the conditioned souls forget their Lord, they are polluted by Mahamaya, the illusory environment, and suffer so much. Maya Maya Devi's job is to create chaos and confusion in the lives of the Jiva souls, so that they become bewildered and and cannot see the proper path and purpose of their life. Maya Devi's function is to hide the jiva souls. Well, the eternal loving relationship with Krishna, she does uh, anything and everything to disturb the conditioned souls. The conditioned souls cannot avoid association with Mahamaya. Suffering in the life of the conditioned soul is natural to expect. It is a natural reaction to the jiva souls. This guided activity that suffering is also good because in it inspires fortunate souls to want to clean themselves of the pollu- pollution of the illusion it inspires them to want to steady themselves and avoid further entanglement within maya existence material mm-hmm. existence mm-hmm. positive and negative power i'm i'm habituated to not believe maya we learned from sri lanka maharaj and other great personalities that we should not believe maya and the trick and the tricks of her illusory environment maya may may have so much power and be able to do anything and everything within her illusory environment but we have learned not to be bewildered by that we honor maya but we we never believe my no doubt we cannot fight with my identity we are tiny souls and we and we must be defeated by her because the lord's power is working behind her but with the spiritual strength which is from guru vaishnavas we can cross over the ocean of maya maya's power is maya's power is negative it comes from the lord but it is a negative power the power coming through guru vaishnav to rescue the conditioned souls is positive it is the lord's positive power descending from his purposeful and positive world whenever the conditioned soul are connected with the world positive power they must be carried beyond the influence of his negative power we have no doubt about this as is the lord's natural desire of love beauty charm and sweetness is fulfilled by the unalloyed unalloyed uh, service of the jiva souls if any jiva soul sincerely wants to dedicate himself to the lord when then the lord will certainly rescue him and give him that chance that is the lord's nature the lord gave the jiva soul free with for will for this purpose as well are the facilitating 
his play of rescuing the jiva souls with the attractive power of his divine form of power and pastimes. Thank you, Maharaj Kirche. Okay, maybe we can pause there and uh, we comment. Anybody has got any questions, please feel free to ask. Shila Gurudev giving very nice explanation there of the power of Maya Devi. And he's using the word misconception at the very beginning of that uh, you know, part. This is the biggest problem is misconception. When we come under the spell of Maya, we fall under misconception. And due to ignorance, we don't know what is real. So uh, Krishna is showing us through so many different wonderful pastimes how Maya Devi is working and how powerful she is. And um, uh, there is one very nice, beautiful pastime. I'm sure everyone is aware of this. Uh, it's a pastime of Sri Narada Muni. Uh, once Narada Muni, he wants to know about Maya. He wants to know about this power of Krishna and how does it work. So he goes to meet Lord Krishna. And uh, while they were walking in the field, so Narada Muni asked Lord Krishna, my dear Lord, can you please show me this power of your Maya, your illusory energy? You know, how does it work? And then Lord Krishna says, uh, my dear Narada, are you sure you want to see this power of mine? So Narada Muni, he was very determined. He says, yes, please, my Lord, please show me. You know, like this. And uh, Krishna says, okay, I will show you. But first, Narada, you know, can you please get me a glass of water? It is so hot, you know, it's terribly hot. And can you please, you know, get, uh, get me a glass of water? So Narada Muni was very happy to do this service to the Lord. And he quickly set out across the field. And after some time, he came to this one village. Uh, when he came to the nearest house, he knocked on the door. And when the door opened, there stood the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. Her sweet smile and her beauty actually captivated him. And all he could do was to look at her beautiful face. Like he became mesmerized. And after some time, he finally asked her, he asked this beautiful lady, will you marry me? So after some time, they were married, they settled down, and then the children began to arrive. So Narada became very busy with his family life, you know, taking care of his family, uh, you know, bathing the children, dressing them, helping to prepare the meals for them. And he was engaged in so many different chores, uh, taking care of the cows, taking care of the land, like this. He was busy with family life and many years went by like this. And one day a very huge flood came. The force of the water was so strong that it washed away the entire village. His land, the cattle, all, all his cows, uh, the house, um, everything was washed away. And unfortunately, also his wife and his children were also swept away by this uh, flood. So Narada tried very hard to save them, but he was very, very unsuccessful. Okay, so finally, he fell to his knees and he cried for help. You know, from the very depths of his heart, he was crying to the Lord, you know, please, my dear Lord Krishna, please help. And when he was praying like this, at once, all the floods, everything stopped. And there was Lord Krishna standing before him on the field as he was before. And Narada looks, uh, Lord Krishna looks at Narada and very gently he asks, oh, my dear Narada, where is my glass of water? You know, <laughs> like this. You know all Krishna asked him for was a glass of water. And Narada completely, you know, he forgot about this. This is the power of Maya. As soon as he left Krishna's presence and he went into that village, you know, Maya Devi, you know, took over and he showed us how many years went by, you know, in his life. Obviously, for the Lord, it was just a moment in time, but you know, for Narada, it was like so many years. And, you know, he forgot that one single small little service he had to do, just to get a glass of water for the Lord. So, like this, Maya Devi can pull us away from our service of the Lord, and that is her service actually. You know, she's expert in that service. She does this. She creates this illusion and makes uh, it makes she makes everything seem so real, and we think it is real. And we see many people running after this, you know, chasing after material wealth and so many things. But before you know it, death is on our doorstep, and we have to leave, and we take nothing with us. And sometimes it's too late to realize this, that it is all temporary, and this world is a world of suffering and misery. So in Narada's case, it was just one moment in time, but for us, it's in every lifetime that we go through this. You know, in every lifetime we're experiencing the power of Maya. And even though we experience this, still it is so difficult for us to let go of this, you know. 
Gurudev in one example or in one lecture, sorry, in one lecture, he's saying that, you know, Krishna is like, you know, one, with one hand he's pulling us, you know, but with the other hand, we're holding on to the pillar. So like on one hand, yes, we realize, you know, the Lord can save us, but we're so attached, we're so conditioned. But the other hand, we're holding on to our material things. So, you know, we're stuck in the middle. So we have to surrender to the Lord. We have to understand everything belongs to him. Everything is for his service. And real joy comes by serving him. And when we come to realize that and fully surrender to Guru Dev Lotus feet, then only we can be saved from Maya. Otherwise, it's not possible. So those who've got that strength, you know, those who've got that strength, they have overcome Maya already. They can help us. It is through their association, their knowledge, you know, that we can that we can overcome misconception and overcome the power of Maya. Otherwise, on our own, it is not possible. Krishna is saying this in Bhagavad Gita. It's in uh, Bhagavad Gita, chapter seven, verse fourteen. Taivye eshagunamai mama Maya duratyaya. Am eva ye prapatyanti mayam etam tarantite. He's saying there, my alluring, tremor, illusory potency is practically insurmountable. insurmountable. Shira Guru Maharaj uses the word insurmountable in his uh, hidden treasure, meaning it is very difficult to cross, very difficult to overcome. However, those who take shelter in me can overcome this powerful obstacle. So Krishna is saying within Gita, that one who takes shelter at the lotus feet, the spiritual master, they can overcome this powerful this Maya, the potency of Maya, Krishna's negative energy. So if we see Krishna as the beautiful bright sun and if we're facing the sun, we do not see a shadow. But if we turn away from the sun and look the other direction, we will see our shadow like that. So where there is a Krishna, where there's auspiciousness, um, there is no shadow potency. Maya is nothing. So something for us to remember. Okay, anyone got any questions, any comments? Okay, maybe we can continue. We are so little and we are so weak. Maya is always taking a toll on us. Even if we surrender, because we understand it is so, so beautiful. All the teachings that we have, Maya is always coming, coming to entice us, to capture us. So the only, the only thing is to try, to try and pray. Oh, my Lord, please, please allow me, allow me to be at the feet of the Vaishnava. So difficult. Uh, thank you, Didi. Yes, it is. It's extremely difficult, you know. Uh, we're reading about it, even though when we read these pastimes, it may seem like it's something easy, but it's not. Maya Devi will always try to trick us, you know, right to the very end. Yeah. So, so important to stay in the association of the devotees. And as you were just reading now, um, in that one part, uh, Guru Devi is explaining there that strength comes from Guru and Vishnava. Because they are coming with the positive energy of Krishna to us, like that. And we need that strength of the devotees, the good association. Srila Guru Maharaj always emphasizes on good association. He says strong faith and good association. And as long as you stay in the association of good devotees, you have the protection. Like that. So that is one of our prayers. We we'll always pray for the association of the Vaishnavas. They can protect us, they can keep us safe. Okay. Okay, maybe we can continue reading. Next part. Pranishwari Didi, maybe you'd like to read Sons of Nectar. Thank you. Uh, Sons of Nectar. Within all the scriptures of India, the Vedas, Vedanta, Upanishads, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and so on, the Lord invites all Jiva souls suffering in the illusory environment to return to his abode. He calls the Jiva souls. Shrimvantu Vishve Amrita Sya Putra Ejvetajvara Upanishad 2.5. You are all sons of nectar. Why are you avoiding me? Come back to your home, back to Godhead. Here everything is ready to give you happiness, ecstasy, service, and joy. Come back to the nectarian ocean of positive spiritual existence. 
It is your property and real identity. You are actually a proprietor of ecstatic spiritual nectar. Your soul has been covered by the illusory environment, but you are really a son of nectar. Divine nectar is here waiting for you to taste it. Please come and accept it. This is the main invitation of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his associates, and all the scriptures. Amrita means nectar, nectar that enables you to conquer death. Positive eternal existence is in is the Jiva soul's transcendental wealth and natural position. Srimvantu Vishve Amrita Syaputra, the Lord and his associates call out in this way, in order to rescue the conditioned souls and give them real immortal nectar, consciousness about their spiritual destiny. They call out to the conditioned Jiva souls. Utishtata Jagrata Prapya Varam Nibodhata, Kata Upanishad 1 3 1 4. Awake, awake, you're sleeping in the lap of Maya. You do not know who you are and what you are doing. You are simply dreaming. Try to realize the value of your own existence and proceed to your life's goal. Shall somebody else continue? continue? We can continue, okay. yeah, maybe. In spiritual association, the general lifestyle of the conditioned souls doesn't lead them to sincerely consider a spiritual life. But when the conditioned souls come into the association of the status and the scriptures, they can be inspired to take a spiritual life seriously. When souls are in the association of persons who can discriminate between matter and spirit, persons who are pursuing their supreme benefit of their spiritual lives, then they will be influenced and inspired. They will think about their own position more and they will begin to feel the existence of their spiritual wealth. Then the soul will begin to inquire about matter, spirit, transcendence, karma, gyan, bhakti, and so on. Through discussion of this topic in the association of the sadhus, and by engaging in the service of the sadhus who enlighten them, the jiva souls will be benefited and their spiritual fortune will be revealed to them. Jai. Thank you very much, Didi. Yes, very nice explanation, Shri Gurudev, giving you about the association of Vaishnavas. Anyone would like to ask any questions on that part? Any comments, maybe? So we see when we sing the song, you know, Shabbatma Thakur is writing so nicely. Emonadurmati Shamsara Bitar, Padiya Chinoami. My wicked mind has brought me to this world, but one of your pure devotees has come to rescue me. So we can only pray and hope, you know, that the patient of us can rescue. Time after time, we are taking birth in so many different bodies, and we know it's only the pure vision of us that can rescue us through their knowledge. They have proper knowledge, they have acquired that. They made sacrifice, and through their sacrifice, so much of good fortune has come to them, strength has come to them. They have crossed over this ocean of misery, and now they are helping us to cross over as well. So how much, you know, we should beg and pray for their association. At the same time, Gurudev is also saying in one of his lectures that while we are praying for the association of these Vaishnavas, the sadhus, sadhu guru Vaishnavas, uh, how much we should try to avoid our satsanga. Asat Sangha means bad association. At the same time, we must be aware of that, you know, um, devotees who are not devotees, well, people in general, you know, that are disrespectful, you know, always causing some kind of offense, offense to the Lord, offense to Guru, offense to other people. You know, you can see that the association is not good for us. And we can see this even in uh, many of the pastimes. You know, there's one pastime of Narakashur, many devotees remember the pastor of Narakashur. He's known as Bauma. Bauma is the son of Bhumi Devi, mother of this earth. So the presiding deity of this earth is Bhumi Devi. And when uh, Lord Varaha Dev, Krishna in the form of a bow, was picking her up from the nether regions and bringing her back to the orbit, to uh, put her into orbit, she became impregnated and she gave birth to Bauma. And he was very powerful. But we see what happened 
he took the association of Banashura. Like that. At one stage, he was engaged in service to the Lord and his devotees. But as soon as he took the association of Bana, he became spoiled. Like that. And he finally ended up fighting with the Lord. Like this. We know what he did. So many sinful activities he performed, you know, uh, where he kept kidnapped the 16,000 princesses. He went into the heavenly planets and he stole the earrings of Aditi. Aditi is the mother of the demigods. So all these kinds of, you know, impious, you can say, sinful activities he was doing. And finally, the Lord had to come and destroy him. And it is, Krishna is showing us, you know, uh, he had the opportunity, you know, he was given so much power. But see what happened when he joined Bana, you know, Bana Shura. He changed. His consciousness became polluted. And he even fought against the Lord. Ultimately, Krishna destroyed him in the end. You know? So like this, Asat Sangha, bad association. You know, you can have so much of power and knowledge. But unknowingly, you know, we may think, oh, it's fine. I've got all the knowledge in the world. I can overcome this. This is nothing. But bad association, you know, our consciousness, we don't realize it becomes polluted in a very subtle way without us even realizing it. That's why our gurus are saying that even when somebody is saying something disrespectful or being offensive, we should try not to listen to it at all. Because slowly but surely, our consciousness becomes polluted with that. We may not realize it. But in the background, it is taking place. So anybody that's speaking in a disrespectful way or saying something disrespectful, it may be to a guru, to a Vaishnava, or anything, you know, anyone, um, we must be careful. Block our ears or run away from them. And from a distance, we will give honor to everyone, but we must be very careful of who we associate with. Okay, I can pause there. Anybody would like to comment? Any other questions? Can you even continue reading? Dandavat Pranam, Dadak Shaja Prabhu. How are you, Prabhuji? Dandavat Pranam, Prabhuji. Dandavat Pranam. Okay, essential question, Dadak Shaja Prabhu. Maybe you'd like to read? Yes. Essential question. That's it, Prabhu? Yes. Thank you, Prabhu. In Sri Chaitanya Charita Amrita, Sanatan Goswami added us Mahaprabhu, Sri Chaitanya Dev. Ke ami kene amai jari taptrai. Iha nahi jani ke mane hit hai. Sadhya sadhan tadva puchite na jani. Kripa Kari Sava Tatva Kahata Apani. Sri Chaitanya Charitamrit Madhalila 20102103. Who am I? Why am I suffering within this material environment? If I do not know this, how will I be benefited? What is the supreme benefit of my life? How can I attain that? I do not know how to inquire properly. Please be merciful to me and reveal these truths in my heart. Sanatan Goswami was not foolish. He was a prime minister of Bengal and a Nawab Hussain Shah. But he asked these questions. There are many examples of great persons uh, in the scriptures such as Maharaj Parikshit and Maharaj Nimi, who ask, who ask simple questions. Such questions are actually the best questions for the conditioned souls. The inspiration to ask questions about the essence of life comes to fortunate conditioned souls through self-realization. The Vedanta Darshan begins Athatu Brahma Jigyasa. Now let us search for the Absolute. Athatu means now after experiencing so many things in the mundane world, 
and gradually coming to properly realize their position, the Jiva souls come to inquire about the absolute. The necessity for spiritual, the necessity for spiritual life can be felt by the conditioned souls only of the fundamental level of realization. Continue, Prabhu. Yes, please, Prabhu. Proper realization helps by understanding consciousness and then the Atma, Self. The first lesson from the Sadhu, the first lesson in spiritual life is Atmanam Vidhi. Know thyself. Try to understand your own self. When a conditioned soul becomes a sincere seeker and he finds a real master, then both the master and the student are fully satisfied. The sadhu teaches the sincere seeker how to discover his own self. Self-realization is the best thing for the conditioned souls. And it is a real necessity of the conditioned souls. When through their fortune, souls begin to search for their own self, they will begin to feel it. At first a little and then more and more. When the, the feelings come to them, then their searching spirit will increase and they will come to understand who they are and the illusion they have fallen into. <laughs> the jiva soul, will gradually realize this body is not actually me. I am simply existing inside this body and mine. My mental position is playing under the influence of the illusory environment. And it is neither acting according to any soul's intelligence, nor guiding me properly. Mm. Very yeah, clearly yeah. explained. <laughs> mm. Yes, Prabhu, you want to say, you can comment, please? Uh, Gurudev has explained it very, very clearly. It's very clear, anyone. And most important is that, as you said, previously, it's only the Kripa of the Vaishnava of Guru that can help us do this. Without it, it's impossible to realize who we are. Mm. And Shila Gurudev also in this uh, passage here, he is using the word self-realization quite a bit here, we can see. So Krishna is giving us freedom. Krishna is most liberal, as Guru Maharaj is saying in one of his lectures. Krishna is most liberal. He's giving us the freedom. You know, From the very beginning, when we are getting this consciousness in the Brahma Jyoti, Krishna is giving us freedom. You want to come up and serve me? As Gurudev is saying, many of the Jiva souls are seeing the bright light and they claim up. And some are thinking, oh, I am so bright. If I go down there, I will be the master I can enjoy. So like this, from the very beginning, we're getting this freedom. Like that. Even when we come to Gurudev as well, Gurudev is not forcing anybody like that. In one lecture, Gurudev says, I don't like to force, I don't like to push anybody. When some divine inspiration coming to me, I am expressing the service. And then who is coming forward to do the service? I am very happily giving that service to them like that. But... Mm -hmm. Gurudev, although he's giving us so much, he's not forcing. But it is for us to realize. Therefore, he's saying self-realization. As more and more is coming to you, as you're diving deeper, you need to realize yourself. What is my position? How I need to serve? What is the position of Gurudev? You know, how do I surrender to him? So this comes through self-realization, the very first part. So we all know this very famous book written by Srila Swami Maharaj Prabhupada, The Science of Self-Realization. I remember this book at one stage, it was so famous and many sincere seekers came to Krishna consciousness just by reading them, you know. Uh, when we used to meet with devotees and we used to always inquire, how did you come to Krishna consciousness? And, they, and, then, and then you hear the devotee say, oh, someone lent me this book, Science of Self-Realization. And after reading that book, you know, all my questions were answered. <laughs> so many of the devotees, when I spoke to them, I remember, they all, most of them, you can say, mentioned this book. The science of self-realization. It is a science to realize yeah. who is God, who am I? How can we try to realize who the Supreme is when I don't know who I am? You know, like that. 
So, yeah. very nice explanation, Shila Guru, they're giving here. Very nice. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I'm not sure what time Satish Prabhu is going to start. Can we continue reading or should we do some kirtan? Mm, we've got um, okay. in the next five minutes. Okay. Should we just continue okay. reading and we do kirtan later? Krishna King Karnavu? Dandavas Prabhuji, yes. Hey, you really you make me happy today. Uh, thank you today. Uh, because because I can hear my Siksha Guru to uh, reading today. So uh, uh, really in, 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 uh, I can I can hear it in a while because I not hear him uh, in preaching or doing class or reading. But today I can hear so Really happy. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> is, you know, he has inspired so many devotees there in Mauritius and also around the world, you know. And I'm always also inspired by him. I think Kanapriya is ready. Hi, um, okay. We will cross over to uh, the London Temple now for Sri Tulasi Devi. Dhanavat Pranams, Hare Krishna, London, West London Temple, and uh, we're just nearly ready, just waiting for Satish to just preparing a few things, and uh, then I'll hand you over. I'll actually turn this around so you can actually see the Tulsi house. How do I turn my camera around? So this is the new Tulsi house that they've been working on for quite some time, and uh, this is the garden. And the temple rooms over there, the kitchen, and the Prashadam Hall is there. So, it's all the Tulsi Maharani's. Ready? That's okay. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> I'll go in. Enjoy the view of Tulsi Morani. So he's just been preparing the ground and to keep the right temperature, which I'm sure he will be telling us. <laughs> about. Oh, it's so beautiful, huh? Eh? Yeah. Mm. Did you that's a new that's a new house that was uh, installed lately? I'm losing you then, Paul. I say this is the new house of Tulsi Maharani that the devotees had installed lately. They, yeah, they just installed this. It took quite a long time to um, install the, the house um, because they had to get all the heating in here, and special heating um, and special fans. So it's very, I think it was quite complicated thing. Uh, and you can see they also have the, the shading at the top there and at the sides. So, uh, because in the UK, you know, the weather here is um, very unpredictable and our winters are very severe. So very hard to keep Tulsi here. Um, you're just waiting for Satish, she's just coming. Were you able to hear the arty okay? Um, yes, we did. Here is Saraswati. 
We're live. Can she see me? Can she see me? Maybe for the little bit. This chair's coming. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. We're just having a few people coming also to listen. And we're just bringing some chairs. Sorry, we're running a little late. It's summer there now. Yes, it's summer. So we have a bit of sunshine, like I said, but it's the UK, so we can have four seasons in one day. It can be raining in the morning, <laughs> then we yeah. might get some sunshine, then it may even snow. <laughs> We've had that before. <laughs> Leela Sundry will know that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, the UK is uh, very unpredictable, but we're having a nice, this all this week has been nice and sunny, but next week is all raining. So to make the most of it today. Please take a seat. Yes. Okay. 
Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> We're very, very happy. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you. <laughs> so many songs. So many songs. And indeed, yeah. many, many times for you to come yeah. and uh, enjoy. So many songs in the start with the month. That is the start Okay, Hare Krishna, everyone. Um, to people joining on the Zoom call and also people participating here. This is my name, Satish, as you probably know. Um, I've been project managing this, this project, which has very, been dear to my heart for many, many years now, I think, probably overdue as well. But, uh, well, about a month ago, we managed to get the Venus all inaugurated. And uh, as you can see, hopefully, she's settled in very, very well. <laughs> so I'll leave you for a minute to just enjoy her darshan. And then I'll start, and then uh, we can uh, obviously go to the side deck. I only want to take 15 to 20 minutes and ask questions. Uh, the reason is because the structure I want to, to go with is not to tell you, but to actually listen to you and understand what your problems are in hopefully uh, growing good school. Okay. Okay, so I was thinking how to, to go about and do a session like this, but I think half an hour is never enough for Maharani. Uh, certainly not for me. I've turned 25 to 30 years, so <laughs> it's never enough. Uh, and even still, I feel still invigorated and uh, passionate about wanting to go ahead and do whatever is it required. But if I look back over all of the the experiences of growing her, all the trials and tribulations, and think about what, what has come to me as, as a fundamental learning. I think I would summarize that in, in terms of the elements, okay? The five elements, I call them Bhashtatva. I'm sure everyone knows what they are, okay? But I think we are spiritual beings, but we also have uh, an identity in ourselves, but then we also have respect for each of the elements as well. And I think, when I, I look back, I think that one of the most important things, you can see a manjari that's grown there, but the whole step and the stages to get to that stage are so important. And that is also part of the offering to Dulce Maharani as well. Okay? We are enlisting the help of all of the elements to help us to make the right decisions and come to the right conclusions. And then hopefully you will see the fruits of everything that we want to desire. And she will bless us with eternal blessings. Uh, I say this from my heart because I don't think that if you went around this, this greenhouse and you, you stood here for probably three or four weeks, you'd see that we're all equally passionate about making sure that she gets everything that she wants. And that passion is, is almost spread across this whole month. And I see that every day with people coming to, to pay their respects, uh, the darshan, to walk around, to put shading up, to water her, to spray her. I'm so happy that actually that has spread amongst all of the devotees. Um, as I say, I'm hoping that some of what I'm about to say will hopefully help you uh, to understand how to, to look after them. So when, when we think about uh, the first element, so we, we talk about Akash, okay? The sky, the environment, I, I call that. The environment for Dulce Marani has, has got to be something which you really think about right at the beginning. We plan this greenhouse and took all of our seedlings from this point, little pot, to where we are today, okay? Uh, and that wasn't done without planning and thinking about the environment. There we go. Oh. Aram Dulsi, but essentially this is where all of the Dulsi Maharani start off as life. Is there some Manjiro on that Dulsi? Yes, yes. Very fancy. Yes. You, I'll show you in a minute. Very, very important. I say this, okay, we are, we're looking at a greenhouse, but we all have a balcony, we all have a window, we have somewhere near our puja um, area. We've got to think about how we actually give her a home in, in our home, okay? And that's one of the most important things. If we can't provide an environment for her, then unless you're prepared to take the risks around watching her grow in summer and then dying off in winter, yeah. then that's very heartbreaking. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I feel pain if, if I see that. And we've also had our fair share of Dulce uh, Maharani's passing as well. But hopefully, you know, the eight or nine that you see here, we've got another one as well. They're, they're obviously here for a reason, which is to, to give everyone the Dutch. And it's been a very, very painful journey, but very, very blessed as well. 
Um, so the, the environment is important. So you might be thinking, well, how can that help me? Okay. It helps you because the main thing that I found, I want to prefix this by saying, whatever I'm showing you here is relevant to this environment in Europe where we live. In India, she can grow out even on the pavement. Um, everything will be fine, okay? And the question then becomes why? Why is she fine there and why is she? But when we look closely, we can see there's a lot of things happening around her, um, which help to explain. Hopefully this, this will um, give you some clues about that. Uh, so the environment back quickly, um, you need a room somewhere. <laughs> South facing because that will give you the sunlight that's required to actually make her grow everything else. But I don't think Maharani needs to stay in a tent. I think she needs an altar. But sun and is she, not always. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is why you look up there. Um, one of our recent devotees has yeah. taken to growing Gulsi Maharani exactly in, yeah. in the space there. <laughs> um, and she's been growing for the last three or four weeks, I think it can happen, okay? Um, so environment is, is key. Please think about where you want to position her. And in due workshops, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the environment as well. I just want to keep this very high level at the moment, okay? Um, the next thing is the air, okay? Air movement helps to explain so many of the issues and problems that people have uh, with growing Maharani as well as keeping it healthy. Okay? We often see that we have pests, so we have green fly, we have white fly, we have spider mites, we have everything. Okay? Um, that is all down to making sure you have good air circulation in, in the environment that you're going to go ahead. In this area here, we've taken two very, very high level decisions. So you see two little blocks of uh, fence, one here, one behind the door. Um, and then you also see <laughs> a main extractor fan. In, in the summer, what we do is normally shield this off. So there's a, a vent which will fall here. We like to give her additional vent. Um, okay. I feel it's going to be to apply canopy. So unusual thing at the bottom, but they're bringing in fresh air. That fan is, is literally not motorized. This fan is motorized and they're bringing constant fresh air. And you can tell that it's fresh air because as you move inside here, yeah. and that, that is very key. How do you replicate that in your environment? Well, you have a window, okay? Near a window somewhere, you need a mesh to protect her. Um, we're going to be mesh on the, the um, greenhouse windows, but you need a very, very fine grade mesh, which will stop all of the spiders, any insects from coming in. Why do they come in? Okay, so this is a really, really good, interesting question. Um, I think... I think there's some connection problem. One of the reasons why yeah. they're attracted to a normal flower, which is attracting lots of insects, they are very, very fragrant and beautiful. So if you stand here on a, on a morning when they've just been misted, the aroma in the air is just wonderful. Okay? And they are attracted just like us. To that. So what we've got to try and do is just make sure they don't eat all of the leaves. And we do that by taking the precautions up front, um, making sure that they, they obviously don't settle on the leaf too far. When the door is closed, we can be happy working in there. Temperature will be probably about 26 degrees. It's very comfortable, very nice to work in. And if you want more ventilation, you have this fan in the front. So that will actually start moving all the air around as well. They're all sensors at the moment, excuse all the wires, but I'm just trying to play with where we want to position the sensors. And they detect what's happening in the environment there as well. Okay. So this is very key. The wind, the air circulation, open a window, make sure she gets good ventilation, and make sure that have a mesh hopefully around her. If you can't do that, then build a little mesh um, just around the pot. Just make sure you don't just leave her unattended because in, in the wrong hands, you, you'll find that there's lots and lots of creatures which are attracted to that. Uh, not only for our adulthood, but her leaves as well. <laughs> okay, um, so that, that's the second area, which is the air, very important. 
um, water. Okay, so how, how do we deal with this? The water can be one of the most difficult aspects to, to get to grips with. I'm sure everyone has always heard someone else saying, oh, I, I think I overwatered her. And I think she's now really suffering, okay? Um, there are ways to make sure that you can um, detect when you need to water her. And I'll be going through some of those in detail as well as what type of water we want to water her with. Things like rainwater are a basic, excellent source of um, water in the Tulsi Maran. But one of the things, depending on where you live, it also attracts a lot of pollution. So you could find uh, you have a lot of petrol in um, the surface of the, the water. In fact, some of you who might store uh, water around here in the water bus will see a very thin film of petrol or, or diesel or anything things on there, which is all literally percolated through the air and, and come like that. So the question then becomes, well, where do you get the water from? We a filter here, all of the water that we water, which is used in the kitchen for this in our eye as well. I'll tell you a little bit about how to, to check the water, what you can do to make sure that the water is suitable for it. So you need to check temperature, you need to check um, the softness of the water as well. And hopefully that then makes a lot of things easier because you'll find that all of the nutrients, the fertilizing of the course in our eye just this becomes a breeze, okay? The tap water is not good. Tap water, Manji, is not good. Usually very, we very, very hard. Usually we give the tap water. Absolutely. Yeah. And if I give you a bottle of this filtered water and you water your Maharani with that for a few months, you'll know what I mean. Okay? <laughs> tap water is very, very hard. Uh, it contains calcium, and calcium present in the water will then disrupt a lot of other chemicals which are required for the uptake of nutrients. Yeah. So, so that's that, that's um, the water aspect. Um, water is also the best cleanser for Tulsi Maharani. I hear people saying, I've used insecticide, I've used this, I've used that. I haven't used any insecticides on her other than probably a little few drops of, of soap if I needed to. Once we had that spider bite in the room, but now I've got it to the rhythm of making sure she has a bath every day sometimes even two or three times a day. And that just cleanses the leaf canopy to make sure that all of the dust everything that settled on the leaves is actually just uh, one bit of that you'll never be insecticide or an organic soap. Like Dr. Bonas, I'll give you some information on that. One or two drops. Uh, some people like to put a bit of neem oil in there as well. Uh, that just helps with making sure that it comes uh, stuck to the leaf. Um, but otherwise, I think using alcohol, using this insecticide, it's not good. Because anything that reaches the Lord, we want to make sure it's pure and it's come from all of the elements that we've actually uh, harnessed okay? and helped to, to, to work. So sometimes it becomes the white stuff on the leaf. Yes, white, the white uh, yeah. stuff that you see is residue if you've used the chemical. Okay. And if you haven't washed the leaves, and sometimes it can also be through to the water hardness. Okay. So calcium will leave its deposits on the leaf. And the problem, I'll just go into this a little bit more in depth. If you if you were to magnify the Dulce Marais leaf, you would see a, a lot of hairs basically on that leaf, which are used to actually breathe. When you start changing the, the composition of those uh, that, that surface you disrupt everything on the leaf structure and then you, you clog up the leaves and then suddenly you'll get a lot of leaf fall and all sorts of issues happen. So this is why it's very important to keep that leaf clean. Okay. Uh, here we don't obviously uh, water, uh, sorry, use any pesticides. So in the morning, all of the plants will be sprayed, the doors will be shut, uh, the ventilation comes on, every plant is washed and then suddenly within about five minutes, the greenhouse will dry straight away. So you don't need to towel dry any of the leaves, you don't need to do anything, you just need to come and, and do the mantras and uh, pick, pick the manjaris, okay? Which, which type of soil is that one? Okay, I'm just going to that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're ahead of the game. See, she because already I knows love, this because... because of course, of course. So that's the water element, okay? Just keeping me on my toes today, definitely. You're definitely keeping me on my toes. 
I said Agni and fire, but actually we don't need, when we say Agni and fire, what we mean is heat. Okay? Um, in this greenhouse, you'll see that we've put three heaters on the sides. Okay? So, so you won't like me saying this, but I don't think uh, we needed three. We probably needed one, but it's better that we have three just in case one breaks down. Um, they provide good wet heat for the Dulce plants. And even now, they're on at night, okay? The reason being, because the temperature that we keep the Tulsi plants at is around about 23 degrees, okay? There's a, a meter inside, which just tells us that it's around about 23, it's times 27, but at night, the temperature always stays to, to 23. There's a light meter which detects that when dusk is settled, okay? So suddenly it knows that the temperature will need to be set at 23 all throughout the night. And then when you come in in the morning, it will still be the same. So depending on whatever happens outside, it's always set to 23. And then obviously the fans will take care of pulling out hot air and making sure that settles, okay? How do you do that in your room? So most people like to leave her in, on top of a radiator or a fan heater, not very nice, okay? If you're gonna do that, you need to do a few more things, which is to keep the air around her moist, okay? Because no one likes a heater right underneath and pumping uh, hot air through the leaf canopy. We just talked about the um, wind aspect and moving wind through pulsy plants, okay? When you have a heater, obviously doing the same thing, you're then moving hot air around the plant, which is very, very, very drying, okay? If you were in a hot room, and you didn't have a moisturizer on or anything, you would suffer the same thing. Your skin would feel very, very tight afterwards. So this is the same thing that happens on the leaf canopy as well. Okay. So the humidity, um, you can raise by having a pebble tray. We can show you some more about that later on. Um, I've got some pebble trays as well. Or you can spray, okay? Uh, so we just talked about the water element, but three or four times a day, a gentle mist on the leaves won't hurt anyone, okay? Um, and you'll find she responds very, very, very well to that. In this environment here, because we, we obviously have many activities happening in, in the temple, we're going to be installing a special system which actually just mists the plants on the top. So when a certain temperature hits around about you know, 28, 29, suddenly the misting system will start and just to give a nice fog mist across all of the plants. And that has the effect of actually cooling down the room and creating moisture in the air. No plants will generally survive in a very, very cold environment. Uh, the only plants which I know of are cactuses. There's still water inside there, so I don't it doesn't like that. Uh, so we talked about heat. One other aspect, and I think this is part of being responsible in this day and age now, is think about insulation. If you're going to have heat in a room, try and have something where you insulate your room or, or actually provide uh, some sort of measure where you don't use that much electricity. I find that these heaters rarely, I've said that they need to be maintained at 23, but rarely do they, they come on in the night all the time because underneath this floor, we have this much insulation, okay? Probably about two or three feet worth of insulation. And it's all built up on layers. So we have foam, we have uh, concrete, we have sand, we have soil. Um, and that's all built up underneath this, this floor. And the effect of that is that throughout the day, when the sun comes in, it's warming up all of the concrete and the foam. And at night, it will release all of the energy back up into the environment. So we're touching now, as you can see, on the environment question, it keeps coming back. All of them play their part in actually helping you to grow herbs very successfully. Yeah. So the final area, this is the soil, okay? Want some soil from there. So it's a very good question you've asked. Um, soil is Mother Earth. Yeah. Okay. Um, the soil, without the soil, you won't have Maharani at all. Okay. So you've got to think very carefully about what soil you use. And when I say think carefully, we, we often say, okay, we want a bit of compost. So let's go down to the garden center and pick up a bag of something. Okay. When you are growing Maharani for the purposes of offering, uh, Mahaprabhu or Krishna, you've got to be serious about how you actually pick up a comp bag of compost. You need to understand what is in that compost and what it is that you are enlisting to get the help to grow the plant. We made the decision to move to organic based composts, okay, and you'll see them in garden centers everywhere. Even those, I would do a lot of research on those, ask the manufacturers what is in that compost before you go and repot her in there, okay. 
The reason being because most compost will have farmhouse additives, slaughterhouse additives, you, you name it, uh, and all sorts of other horrible, nasty things which you don't want to, to use to, to grow cultivar. Okay. In in probably about three or four months' time. Uh, I would like to organic soil, a completely different way of uh, growing herb. And I say completely different way because most of the, the pots that you see here are soil-based pots, okay? But in, in the last year, we've been trialing some very specific types of soil. Okay? So here, we have our... Which is growing literally in a sandy valley. Yeah. Oh, it's very dry. Very dry. Yeah. And often people say, well, how will she survive? Yeah. Can I have one plant? So here, <laughs> you see this the same aspect. So there's very little soil in here. Can she survive? Well, yes, there's. Uh, little Maharani, which is growing up here just inside, okay? This little tea, um, unfortunately, we let her go to Manjari uh, a few three or four times. So, as you can see, what tends to happen is you have the habit of cultivating her and offering Manjari. Because as soon as you do that, you then promote vigor inside uh, the plant. If you let it go to seed, then effectively the job is being done. And um, as they say, they run by her. <laughs> so she will leave pretty quickly. But we, we tend to have a, a rule here, probably about every three or four days, all of the Majaris will be harvested. Probably we're talk talking about a couple of hundred Majaris come out of this yeah. every week. Um, each plant will, in fact, produce what, about a hundred as well. So this one has many, many Majaris in there. So there's the, the soil question. And the reason why soil is so important is because when, when you, some of you have been to school, you've probably heard about compositions of each of the soils, okay? Some soils um, have nutrients and minerals in them. If we can start to think about how those soils have what minerals and nutrients, you can then start to make sure that you provide a very healthy, nutritious soil in itself, rather than having to put chemicals and fertilizers inside. Uh, and that is a whole, whole, whole new dimension for growing cultivar. Yeah. But it, it's something that I want to make sure that we've got perfected and, and working well. So we need a couple more months still to make sure that it goes to a cycle. Are we going to the pH and sort of acidity? Yes. So I, the reason why I kept it very high, because pH and acidity is a workshop in itself, uh, because it, it joins everything. It joins up with um, the water, the composition itself, the soil, uh, the heat in the room, everything else is all related to that. So it's not very easy to just discuss as a single topic, but I, I will cover that as well. Yeah. All right, so I think I'm going to jump through this slide. Nick. There's pretty much, we've covered everything that, that we needed to cover there. Uh, so one area that I think people struggle with is how do I know I've got a Dulcie plant? Okay. Um, often you see people, Dulcie will, will Predominantly is two, two varieties, Ram and Sham. How do you tell that uh, I've got a Ram Dulce? So this one here is predominantly green. This is a Ram Dulce. This is a Sham Dulce. The Sham Dulces will turn completely purple in about three or four weeks' time once they've had almost 12 to 13 hours of, of sunlight. And some of them are already turning purple, as you can see, but they will go completely purple. Um, and that's very important because often if you're growing dulce, you need to recognize what type of plant you've been given or what type of seed you, you have. And many people grow ordinary basil, which is used for pesto, but that's not actually the basil that is worshipful. Okay. So if you need help with that, please by all means come, come to us, uh, or we can direct you and find what plant you have, uh, send us some pictures. I'm very happy to help anyone with that. Okay, so that's um, a little bit about the shaman run varieties. Uh, seeds, so seeds are really important as well. If you let some of these manjaris go to seed, you can probably afford to have one or two plants have 
one one dry. If you let it go to completely seed, you've got a very, very good chance you'll have very fresh seed. And in fact, some of you just saw a minute ago, that some of the seeds that fall on the soil naturally seed themselves. Uh, so it becomes just a, a really nice cycle of uh, picking up the plant and putting it up and uh, making it grow into another big plant. The flowers in the manjaris we've talked about, um, there is obviously a procedure how we harvest those manjaris and, and the leaves. We'll talk about that as well in, in future workshops. Um, and the form and the shape. So one thing that we must always think about is that Pulsi Marani cannot be cut with cicatures um, into a shape that you desire. Her form is the eternal form that you see here. And it's achieved by dedicated harvesting of the manjaris. When you harvest those manjaris in the prescribed way, according to our shastras, you will see her form appear like that. If you take the step to actually cut her with secateurs, you will never ever see her, her form appear. Um, and I say that with wholehearted conviction that you, you must never ever cut, cut, cut the branches. The only exception being when a branch has died back and you are finding that it's going to harm the, the, the structure of the plant. And by that, I mean, some branches will naturally die back. Okay. Um, you can see here, there's a little branch which is dying back. Um, that's probably due to a number of reasons, but that, that is permissible to cut back to a point where um, you have a nice bud, okay? But nothing else is ever permissible. If you look in all of our shastas, it's not something that you should be doing. Uh, it's, it hurts Maharani and should hurt you if you're a proper devotee of her as well. Okay? Um, life expectancy. So, we have some plants. Uh, I have one plant in my home, which is almost 12, 12 years old. Um, this plant here is also possibly about 9 to 12 years old, but she's in a certain soil, which is making sure that she keeps at that, that, that stage. So these plants are probably 3 to 4 years old here, and these are probably another 2 to 3 years old as well. Uh, some of these were given by a devotee. Uh, this is a very special um, Maharani because she was left by a devotee as a little seedling um, with Saraswati and Lavanyadi. And we've noticed her and brought her back. And he often comes in and uh, takes her darshan when, when he can. <laughs> okay. Right, so that's, that's the form and expectancy. So you can expect to stay in your house probably for many, many years. The specimens, which will probably be almost 20, 20, 25, 30 years old as well. But this all comes with preparing for her arrival and making sure that you have prepared a place where you will be able to look after her um, in your home and give her permanent residence. If you can't do that, then actually it's better to go to a temple or somewhere else and take her darshan because I think that is equally as, as beautiful. Um, seasonal changes, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. So this is a very, very important point as well. In, in, the, in the summer, where the plants are growing, you need to adopt a certain regime of how you will water her, how you feed her, how you harvest the manjaris. In winter, that takes a little bit of a sidestep. Unless you're going to use artificial lighting to keep her at the same level, then you will find that you need to obviously cut back on the watering. You need to make sure she has more sunlight. Uh, and you need to make sure she has good air circulation and heat as well. And I'll discuss a little bit more about what happens during those seasons because you will start to see the signals of all of those seasons in one place. So some of you who came to the inauguration ceremony four weeks ago may be looking at the DC plants and thinking, okay, they've grown. But actually, they have shed a lot of leaves since that point. They've probably shed more leaves than I could ever imagine, and I lost many, many sleepless nights as a result of that as well. But the reason for that is they've changed from a room environment to full sunlight. And as that happens, the leaf will give you very, very good signals about what's happening. So even now, some thoughts are going through some changes. So you can see that the yellow leaves here, these are complete leaves which will fall down and she will then rechange and give these new leaves here. Okay. Those are the signals. It's not that she's actually needs more minerals or anything, nothing like that. So don't feed her, but that's what the signal is there. 
So it's very important to, to start understanding what those signals are as each season changes. Um, in your home, it'll be the same thing. You'll find the number one problem there will be the light level will fall and you'll suddenly see yellow leaves. So that's time to actually try and move around somewhere where you've got a lot of lights. Okay. Usually sometime in September, they all come in. Not this year, hopefully, <laughs> okay, for you. Not this year. <laughs> um, pests and diseases. So this is a topic in itself. There are a number of pests and diseases which will happen. Insect-based as well as fungus-based um, pests and diseases. A lot of that can be controlled through the watering schedules that I've talked about of how we water and wash the leaves, and also the soil that we use. Uh, soil has a lot of airborne pests as well, so you just need to be mindful of the fact that that's something that's going to happen if you haven't chosen the right soil. Uh, but anyway, more on that to follow as well. Okay, sorry, I have gone over a little bit. I want to just make some notes because there's a um, series of workshops coming where I want to go into each of these topics, but I want to understand what types of questions you have, if any. Those of you on the, the Zoom call, if you would like to pass some to Kate, that's great. So we can incorporate those as well. Uh, but anyone who's here, please feel free to just jump ahead and uh, tell me whether there's any questions in your mind or things which you feel. Shall I ask covered. if there's any questions? Yes. Please. If there's any questions, has anyone got any questions for Satish? I would like to ask what is the proportion of that uh, draw for two? of soap what is that can you repeat yep. that provenance rate what yes. is the yes he mentioned he mentioned about one or two drops in the water ah to, yes to bathe her yes, yes, but yes. i want to know the yes. proportion one yes, drop so in one okay. liter fine in so, one gallon yes so fine so depending on the type of plant you've got, if you've got a large plant, you're going to need to make up hopefully about a litre or two litres. Uh, if you've got a smaller plant, then you probably need to make up just half a litre, 500 ml. And generally speaking, what I would advise is put one drop, one to two drops of something like that, an organic soap, like Dr. Bonner's, and put one or maybe even just two drops max of neem oil, okay? Mix that up very, very fast and agitated in the water inside a sprayer and you can spray her down with that and the, the trick with that i'll just mention because obviously you've got a problem with with that the trick with that if you've got a small plant is to just take the leaf and make sure you spray on the underside of the leaf okay uh, the reason being because most of the pests that you see will be on the underside um, and just try and rub the leaf a little bit underneath so that the um, soap will, will just disperse underneath it needs to be very, very gentle, but thorough. But then the next trick is to make sure once you've washed the whole plant with the spray, wait about half an hour or so, and then rinse it completely off with, with new water, okay? Never leave that on the leaf structure because it can do untold damages. You can actually have leaf burn. You can have a number of things happening. Uh, so I think it's best to err on the side of caution to wash it off completely if it's been passed. Does so that answer your question? Yes. Okay, um, good. Any other questions? All right, we're, we're going to jump a little bit because obviously this is a very interesting question that everyone has. So fre frequency of watering. Let's just use one tulsi plant here. So this, this plant obviously needs to be watered soon, okay? But actually I don't think she needs to be watered today. The reason being, if you look at the leaves, the leaves are very, very rigid at the moment, okay? They're not soft, okay? The softness in the leaf indicates a thirst for water, okay? If the leaf is pointing down or it's very, very soft, okay? That means that you need to water very, very quickly, probably in the next three or four hours, if that's the case. But all of these leaves, if you can look at them, they're all springing back, okay? They're alive, they're well, um, they don't need to be watered today. But having said that, because it's been a dry day, probably earlier in the morning is the best time to water. To answer your question about how do you detect whether I need to water, so one of the things that 
you, you find uh, with dotty plants is that the, the soil will crumble like this, okay? The top inch of soil will normally start crumbling, okay? That's a signal to say, water me soon now, because actually everything underneath is drying up quickly. It's aggravated by the fact we're using clay pots, okay? Clay pots are not forgiving in terms of watering because they will suck out all of the water from the soil, okay? It's a very good thing though, because in winter, it makes sure that you don't have a plant which is suffering from rot, okay? That's the number one killer for Tulsi plants, certainly uh, in the homes that I've seen, where people overwater her when actually she doesn't need water, okay? The other thing, which I will say, but I think is a little bit contentious, is to offer her water every day, okay? You should probably get into the habit of offering her very one or two drops, but not whole uh, lota or anything like that every day, because that doesn't do anything for the root structure underneath. The reason being, when you want to water her, you want to water her so that it drenches the whole soil and comes out the bottom, okay? Then you know that you've actually saturated the whole of the soil base. If you don't do that, then what will happen is in time, you will get sections of dieback like this, okay? That, if you were to follow this stem all the way back down somewhere into the soil, there will be pockets of soil which have not been watered because you may have watered them with a little bit of a glass or, or so or whatever, okay? But you haven't saturated the soil. And that's why it's so important to get into a good habit of watering, okay? The other way to tell is to obviously just dip your finger a little bit inside and see whether or not, when you just come back down, you can see any moisture. So there we can see there's a bit of moisture there. If there was no moisture, it wouldn't stick to my finger, okay? Which means it, it needs to be watered, okay? And just to prove that, just go down to this one. You can see this is pretty much watered nicely yeah, and even, okay? If you don't like that, and you don't feel that that's comfortable for you, then what you can do is buy a meter. You get a nice uh, moisture meter. I've got one here somewhere. There we go. Not working, but it should give us what we need. It just tells you the pH and the water, okay? I'm just gonna dip this in here and just show you. Okay, so isn't this interesting? We would think that this is needs water on the top, but as I push this down a little bit, it says it's actually quite wet. Yeah. So you can tell you you would be doing a lot of damage to her if you continue to water her. Uh, so this probe is quite useful. Okay. Uh, but you do need to look after it. Obviously, it needs to be wiped down. But I don't use that too often now. Uh, the final thing is, if you don't have that, then you can. Here's chopstick. Okay, I haven't got one here. An ordinary wooden stock chopstick. Don't put it into the root ball just here, but on the side. Let it go right the way down, and then wait about half an hour. Take the chopstick out. You'll be able to see where it saturated the wood. Okay, and that will tell you how far down the soil. It's moist and half fire burn it, so it's dry. Okay. All right. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. The final thing, and I'm not suggesting for once that anyone should do this, but when we talk about potting, okay, there's a way of actually potting her, um, which will allow you to just raise that soil ball completely without agitating anything, okay? So from here, I can tell now by looking in the root structure, Actually, it's quite moist inside, okay? The beauty of this is that when you come to repot her, you can just lift out the whole of the soil ball and put it inside a new pot, okay? It doesn't work that, that quickly for big plants. You need two or three people, but this is a, a very nice technique for actually making sure that you um, can pot her and check the root system now and then, okay? And in fact, that's another point I'll just quickly go to. Many people use gravel and stones in the bottom of a pot. I wouldn't suggest you use that. The reason being is over time, inside a pot, you have something called a water table. So the water, as you, as you water, will go down, 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 down. It'll come out through all of the, the pebbles. But then the actual moist area of the soil will sit on top of the pebbles and that will stay moist for a very long time, okay? The problem with that is in summer, it's okay. In winter, that can cause rot. Because if you can imagine the roots are somewhere here and you've got this much soil, and that's helping to keep her on a bed of very, very wet soil. 
which will just prolong um, wetness and then make sure that it'll actually help a lot of bacteria grow and a uh, bacteria to grow and that will actually spread through the whole root system and you'll notice a number of problems. That's it. That's it. One more. Uh, I mean, you talked about the composition of the soil. Yes. Uh, what about feed? Regular feed. Okay. Is there? I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, so feed feeds. You have two choices. You can go with a chemical based feed, or you can go with an organic based feed. On the market, there are so many feeds that uh, you can buy. Okay. Uh, some are also animal based as well. So you, can, you have all sorts of other weird things in there. Um, if you get the soil right. I, if you use calcium based soil, you might use a little bit of peat, or you might, if you've got cow dung, you can use that. Okay. If you get that composition right, you should be able to avoid having to use nutrients and pesticides, uh, sorry, nutrients on there. But having said that, there'll come a time when you get a plant like this size where you have to actually supplement it. Okay. The trick with that is two things you can actually remove half an inch of soil and replace it with new soil. That will help get nutrients down into the soil area, or you can buy some new feeds and there's some links which we'll be sending you in some uh, manuals at the end of the session, where a company called Biovis, they do very, very nice organic uh, products. You can use one or two mils of that in some uh, water and that will help to, to give us some of the nutrients. But having said that, the soil should provide all of the nutrients, but there'll come a time when even feeding her won't do, you'll have to actually give her a new pot, okay? Um, you could find that you'll still get yellow leaves. You'll find that you have less manjaris. You get all sorts of problems. And predominantly, that's because the soil needs to be changed. Okay? In the ground, you don't have that problem because obviously the ground has much, much more than what you want. I will come on to that. That's, it's, a, it's a very, very big area. Which nutrients, when, how, and uh, what to use? Okay? Uh, a whole, whole topic on that. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Have you any questions for you? No? There you go. There you go. So now I want to buy the soil and plants. Okay. You don't, you don't need to buy the soil and you don't need plants because just by coming on this workshop, I'm happy to give you a plant, but I want you to come back for a few more times to really become completely uh, an expert at this. And uh, as I said to Sarasri, that's part of our bhakti yoga to you. Okay to educate you on how to actually look after her so you can go and then hopefully tell someone else that this is the way to do it, okay? We need some places, someone, everyone can buy the tulsi. Maji, there's no need to buy tulsi. If yeah, you are a proper seva, <laughs> you should give tulsi marani to anyone, okay? She, there's no reason to buy her, not in my heart. <laughs> okay, I no know reason. so many people. No, you must not buy her at all. All right. Good. Okay. So thank you. thank you very much, everyone on the, the Zoom call. I apologize if I've spoken to the audience here, not to yourselves, but in due course, I hope that you'll join these sessions. And I would like to obviously make sure that you get the best out of these sessions. So please give Kate uh, some, some uh, questions, anything that you feel is, is a topic worth mm -hmm. devoting, and I'll make sure that's included in the sessions. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. Very good. Don't know what to Right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we'll sing uh, Tulsi Marani Arti now. Yes, it'll be nice if we could do that. Uh, yeah, first, firstly, I want to say that it was so informative, and you know, um, I've heard devotees talking about Tulsi Marani and taking care of her, but this was really you know, in depth knowledge that you were sharing. So I think it'll be nice if devotees have any questions in future, maybe send it to Kanupriya and then. She can speak to uh, Satish Prabhu and you know, get some feedback from him. Because just by looking at all the Tulsi Maharani's in the greenhouse, you can see that you know he's really taking such good care of them and he knows what he's doing. So it's good to learn from devotees who have that kind of experience. Wonderful. Yeah, so thanks to Kanopriya Didi for arranging that. Finish very Didi, yes. I'd like to. Yes, uh, the, the Tulsi that he showed that it was on the left side at the end. And he said, the, sometimes she's the one taken to get the darshan. Um, I, I recalled in one uh, Zoom uh, 
a transmission. I think it was the, the West London uh, celebration. It was anniversary, the last one. Sheila Chajadev, when he saw that beautiful, green, rounded, healthy, amazing Tulsi, he immediately said, who is taking care? So Satish was brought to the front and he <laughs> said, this is devotion. This is devotion. It was so beautiful. And, sorry, and, sorry. and Sheila Chajadev's face, Maybe. brilliant. Yes? Yes? That, that, uh, that, it, sorry, Dandavan. That, that, that you're talking about is um, it's a Tulasi that he has in his house. That's uh, like the biggest Tulasi. Oh, oh. Which but he, he brought it to your festival and it was yeah, amazing. In a Sheila big Chaya there band. was delighted. Yeah, mm. in a big van, he brought that with his brother. So now he has that one only in his house and now he cares for all of these ones here. Oh, okay. But their mm. ones are becoming also like that big one now. Yes, and, and that's what he mentioned. He said that one at the, at the end on the left side is the one that goes in to take the direction. So I thought it was the yes. same one. Sometimes now this one takes goes to the Temple of Mumbik Festival. Mm. We wrote the okay, beautiful. Yes. Oh, sorry, Didi, for interrupting you. Go on. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be sorry, Didi. <laughs> to you. Okay. Hello. Okay. Yes, uh, Praneshwari Didi, I remember that one session. Um, and I, I remember clearly she actually used the word mountain. She said, a mountain of love. <laughs> yeah, she was so huge and so beautiful and bright. Yeah, amazing. All right, then I can share, let me share the song. We can sing through Sati and have Maha Mantra one time after that. And, uh, Maybe we can request other Chaja Prabhu to sing. Let me share quickly. Oh, Prabhu sing today. That's so good. <laughs> share. The devotees would like to chant. Is Prabhu Ishwaranand here? Ishwarananda. Yeah, Ishwarananda mm. Prabhu can chant. Is he there? Yes. I always yes. present. <laughs> Sing Prabhu, Jai. Namo Namah Sudasi Maharani Vrinde Marani Namo Namah Sudasi Maharani Vrinde Namo Namah Hore na hore maya namo narayani namo hore na namo hore maya namo narayani namo nama tulashi ma narayani namo nama Namo Namah. 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 Nam
महारानी की जय श्री वृंदा देवी की जय गोर प्रेमानंदी हरे हरे श्री श्री गुरु गौरा गंधर्वा गोविंद संभार जी की जय गुरु गौर नित्यानंद जी की जय गुरु श्री श्री भक्ति निर्मला छ जगत स्वामी महाराज की जाम विश्वा जगत गुरु श्री श्री भक्ति सुंदर गोविंद देव गोस्वामी महाराज की जाम विश्वा जगत गुरु श्री श्री भक्ति रखिधार देव गोस्वामी महाराज की जाग गुरु वर्ग की जाष्ण वृंद की जाशिल हरिदास ठाकुर की जाशा प्रशाशि नित्यानंद प्रभु की जाशा प्रशाशि महाप्रभु की जा श्री श्री राधा कृष्ण गोप गोपन श्याम कुंद राधा गिरी गोवर्धन की जाय श्री चैतन्य सरस्वत की जाबोटिस की जाल्ड वाइड डिबोटिस की जा श्री तुलासी देवी की जाय श्री हरिनाम संकीर्तन की जाय गो हे हरि हरि बो धन्यवाद धन्यवाद Thank you all again for joining us. It was really nice to have you on the association. Looking forward to seeing all the devotees again next week Saturday. So stay safe, take care. Till we meet again. By the mercy of Shila Guru Dev. And I humble down about from to everyone. Please forgive my offences. Hello, Hare Krishna. Namaskar, Krishna Das Ki Jai. Hare Guru Dev. Hare Krishna. Hare Guru Dev. Hare Guru Dev. Hare Guru Dev. कृष्णानंदिनी की जय हरे कृष्ण ईश्वरी देवी की जय ओके थैंक यू ब्यूटीफुल प्रोग्राम वेरी इंस्ट्रक्टिव थैंक यू सो सो मच हरे कृष्ण